So the next thing is that we look at is the reason to maintain biodiversity. I guess the argument or the story that we're telling is there's some factors that reduce the biodiversity. Okay, we can't just take it for granted that having biodiversity is a good thing. Let's justify why it's important to have high biodiversity. Okay, right. So, summary. The main reasons to maintain biodiversity are in the categories of ecological reasons, genetic reasons, economic reasons and aesthetic reasons. Okay, so ecological reasons really revolve around, and this is a phrase I, I see coming up on, you know, in the mock schemes, but again we have to kind of talk about what that means, the interdependence of organisms. This idea that <coughs> organisms don't just, they're not, they don't exist in isolation. They exist in these inter interactive communities, okay? And there's a number of different ways that organisms interact with each other. It's, it's not, and it, one of those relationships is obviously to do with food, one organism obtains its nutrition from a different one, but there's much more to it than that, okay? So the idea is that ecosystems consist of populations of different species interacting with each other in communities. Now here's the important thing, the survival of each population depends on these interactions, okay? And most of the time the relationship might be about nutrition, but there are other different types of interactions that can occur between these organisms, these populations. Okay, so the obvious one is here, shown in this kind of, in this uh, food web, that um, organisms are connected to each other by the consumption of food basically, okay, or what they consume in order to get their nutrition. But there's other types of relationships, so you've got predation, you know, when, when, a, when a cow eats grass, that's not predation, I'd, I'd rather call that just straightforward consumption, okay, but yeah, when an organism eat, when an animal eats another animal, then that's predation. But there's other relationships too, and this is all about the dependence of one population's survival or numbers on, a, on another population. So pollination is a big one, okay? Um, you might have heard about the importance of, of bees and other pollinators to, you know, food crops. And it's, it's really all about um, kind of one species being, one species is reproduction, it's the pop the maintenance of its numbers um, is dependent on another species. In this case, in order for plants to be able to sexually reproduce, they need the bees and other pollinators to transfer pollen from one plant to another. Okay, and there's various symbiotic relationships where it's on a scale of, you know, how much it is of benefit to each partner. And in, in this video, you can um, look at the different examples of those different relationships. But, you know, the main idea here is that organisms' survival not only depends on kind of getting food for, for themselves from somewhere, but it's much more to do. An ecosystem only exists because of all the interactions that the species in that ecosystem have with each other you take one of those species out, it affects, the, it affects m many of the other organisms in that ecosystem I in, in different ways because of the interactions that they have, okay? Now, this is, the, th this is how we get to what the value of each of these species is, is that human activity may, let's say human activity affects even a single population, or it might affect some populations in the ecosystem. 
because of the interdependence of organisms, this not only affects those species, okay? Th you know, because of the interdependence, it, that, the impact that humans have on one or two of the species potentially affects the entire ecosystem, okay? Now, um, let's look at this example right here. Now, this is a, um, a habitat where this is essentially the before, and this, whoops, going on. and this is the after. Okay. Now, what, what, before what? So this is before the. So this part is before the introduction of wolves back into this habitat. So it used to have wolves, but then, um, for whatever reason, the wolves were lost from this ecosystem, and as a result the whole habitat suffered. Because of the reintroduction of the wolves, look at the effect, look at the impact it has on the growth of, um, you know, the plant life in that habitat. The argument is that because of the presence of the wolves, the, the you know, the herbivore population that they might have been kind of feeding on, on the plants, the herbivore population, the primary consumer population would have been controlled by the wolves. Therefore, the overgrazing of this area wouldn't have happened, allowing the plant life to kind of recover. Okay? And without the wolves, there would have been too many of these herbivore organisms. They would have been overgrazing, consuming too much of the plant life, and because of that, the whole ecosystem suffered because it went out of balance, okay? But introducing the wolves kept the herbivores, kept the primary consumer populations under control. Therefore, it allowed more plant life uh, to, to populate. And because of that, many other species that were dependent on those plants now have enough food to then re-grow uh, their populations, okay? So some of these relationships are more complex than simple predator-prey. Predator um, the top predators in you know, any ecosystem are, are very, very important for, the, for all the species in the ecosystem, even though they are consuming some of them. Okay, now, <clears throat> why, what's this got to do with biodiversity? The idea is that if biodiversity is high, there's high numbers of many different species in the community. That means that if you do get some kind of impact on one of the populations or two of the populations, it might not affect other species as each species has an alternative species that it might be able to use for as its prey or as its food source. Okay. So for example, if we look in, in this particular food uh, web here, if you lose the grasshoppers, okay, say a certain chemical is introduced into the environment, it affects the grasshoppers and the grasshopper population dramatically declines. But if we lose the grasshopper from this food web, the frog, for example, because the, you know, generally speaking, we can consider the biodiversity to be high, the frog can use the butterfly for a food source as an alternative. It's not solely dependent on the grasshopper. Um, yep, so that's, that's the idea here. But if the biodiversity was low and the frog didn't have an alternative food source, because the butterfly, butterfly population was low or non-existent, then the loss of the grasshopper would have resulted in the loss of the frog, okay? And then that would have affected other things further up the food chain as well. So the idea is that when biodiversity is low, there is greater interdependence and because of that, human activity could have a bigger impact on that ecosystem than if that ecosystem had a high biodiversity. It could, it could almost kind of absorb the effect 
of the human impact. Okay, now a related idea is keystone species. Now keystone species are organisms or species that ecosystems are highly dependent on. And you know their role in the ecosystem cannot be replaced by other species. Okay, so just got some examples down here, but you know, but the idea being that keystone species, you know, if if humans if humans impact on the keystone species, then that's going to have a big impact on the ecosystem as a whole, not just on that species. Okay, right, now we move on to genetic reasons for conservation. With the genetic uh, reasons, it's, it's really to do with this idea that biodiversity is of value to humans okay um, it's not just the it's not just the idea that well we should maintain biodiversity because it's the right thing to do it's more to do with this idea that actually there's there's benefits of biodiversity having a lot of variation in the natural environment is of benefit to the human um, lifestyle to the human uh, population Let's look at how that is, okay? So the idea goes that because organisms have been evolving for millions of years, and the natural populations have been adapting to a variety of different conditions, okay, those populations, in those wild populations, remember that you know, there's a lot of genetic variation within the wild population because no one's going around kind of saying, oh, this variety is better or that variety is better. That's being naturally selected. Well, because of that, they have developed characteristics because of the alleles that they have that could be useful to us. So, for example, you know, uh, organisms have been uh, developing or evolving resistance to disease. They've been uh, developing adaptations to survive in uh, hot climates, dry conditions, things like that. And it means that because the, those wild populations have the alleles to cope with this, these conditions, we might be able to use those alleles um, for something in the human interest. Okay, but if those alleles don't exist in nature, they're not there for us to use and take advantage of. Let's have a look at an example. Okay, so for example, uh, you know, uh, we have disease resistant banana, but really this is, this is just about saying, uh, this is just about this idea that if there is a useful allele out there somewhere in nature, all we have to do is find it and then we can take that allele out of that plant, put it in a different plant, and then we have given, you know, our plant a new characteristic that it might have taken millions of years for it to develop naturally. Okay, so got banana plants, right? So banana plants are infected by uh, these bacteria, Xanthomonas campestris, as well as a, a, a different organism called nematodes, and you know they, they result in uh, loss of these banana crops. Okay, a product the plant uh, dies, uh, the banana product is not sellable. Okay, and it you know it's, it causes a big impact on, on the economy of, of the country in which the bananas are grown. Okay, however. It is known that red pepper plants, so these guys right here, red pepper plants are resistant to these particular uh, pathogens. Okay, uh, resistant to the bacteria, resistant to the nematodes. Research identifies the genes that are responsible for the resistance in the pepper plants. Okay, and then to cut a long story short, you find the genes in the genome of the red pepper plant. So you take the cells, uh, uh, you know, extract the DNA, you cut the genes out that give this plant resistance to those uh, pathogens. You take the gene, 
So now we're up here. You get the gene, you put it in a vector piece of DNA, you transfer the vector into a bacterial cell, and you use the bacterial cell to infect um, the uh, banana plant cell. In the process of doing so, the gene f for the disease resistance is transferred into the banana plant cell. Then you grow those banana plant cells in culture. Now they divide by mitosis, so all the banana, all of the, of the cells in this plant that you can see here are copies of the original banana plant cell that now has the disease resistance gene. And now you grow the banana plant up from the from this shoot here and now the banana plant has resistance to the bacteria as well as the nematodes basically they are now disease resistant because they have be, you know because they are a genetically modified organism uh, the genes from a different plant have been transferred into essentially the banana plant and now the banana plant is disease resistant okay the principle is that if we had let the red pepper plants become low in biodiversity th you know these valuable disease resistance genes m we may never have found them okay and because of that we would never have been able to use them to provide or give resistance to the banana plant okay so this is really all about you know f having enough variety and enough kind of um, diversity in alleles that useful alleles can a develop and b remain in the population long enough for us to find them but if we reduce the population's too small that we lose those populations we don't find those useful alleles and we don't get to use them for our benefit next okay so plants <coughs> animals you know generally living organisms are potential potential sources of medicinal substances we've kind of touched on this already okay uh, when we were doing the communicable diseases uh, section. But, um, you know, these organisms have evolved. Again, they've evolved over millions of years and they, they are producing some substances that give them a selective advantage, that give them resistance to diseases and pests. And if they're producing these substances um, against these types of organisms, it might be that we can also use them uh, to create medicines against similar types of organisms, okay, that might be affecting humans, all right? So we've looked at already that plant substances have med medicinal effects. We've looked at this idea of microorganisms that produce antimicrobials, the penicillium mold that was producing uh, substances that um, prevented the growth of bacterial colonies. Okay, so microorganisms have, you know, evolved to produce substances that allow them to compete for limited resources, but we can use those as, you know, to, to, to the advantage of the human population by using them as antibiotics. Okay, so the key idea here is that loss of biodiversity could mean loss of species and alleles that could have benefits for human life. Okay, next we move on to economic reasons for conservation. Okay, economic reasons for conservation. So this is the idea, okay, so the central idea here is that ecosystems have a valuable kind of contribution to the human way of life, okay? It allows humans to work, it allows humans to live in the way that they do, and because of that, it allows, um, you know, the, the economies of countries to function. 
So let's look at then what, you know, how is it that these ecosystems are valuable to the human way of life? So we have regulation of the atmosphere, hydrosphere and climate. Okay, so essentially we're talking about, well, I mean, if you want to bring it down to basics, you know, photosynthesis occurring, provides oxygen into the atmosphere, you know, many kind of toxic substances are absorbed by plants removed from the atmosphere, um, water filtering occurs, regulation of climate, rain, all, all of that stuff happens because of the um, ecosystems around the world. We're not just talking about kind of forests and things, aquatic ecosystems as well. Okay, uh, purification and retention of fresh water, um, the formation of soil, yeah? So here, you know, soil isn't kind of just there. Soil is a combination of mineral but also organic matter and that soil is there because of you know other species that have a first colonized the area when there there wasn't any life there before they colonized it they you know populated that area died that organic matter got added in to the uh, to to the you know the sand or whatever it was and that turned you know, the more mineral substance into, you know, the, the organic matter containing soil, which now can be used for, you know, the growth of crops. That can't be understated, the, the importance of, you know, the presence of ecosystems to the things we have available to us right now. Okay, uh, recycling of nutrients. What that means is, um, decomposer. So when when things die, they don't just kind of stay there. Uh, those nutrients get recycled back into the soil, so so that that those molecules can can still be used. Okay, and it's decomposers that take those molecules of the dead organisms, be it plant or animal take those molecules, digest them, recycle them um, so that they can be used by other organisms. Pollination of crop plants, which we've discussed, the provision of timber for building, food for the human um, uh, population, and even fuel. Okay, and finally, source of medicinal substances. So it's just a consideration really of the idea that certain th certain things that we might take for granted um, about the w way of life that we have is still directly or indirectly dependent on ecosystems that are existing around the planet. Aesthetic reasons for conservation. So this is this is to do with the essentially it's the, it's the health and well-being that humans get from interacting with nature, being able to access nature in a variety of different forms, okay? Um, and it's first, the first idea is, which is important is it, this is not just physical well-being, okay? So yes, we have physical health, we also have mental health aspects that we need to consider and because of that um, these are the benefits that natural environments give to us okay the next idea is that um, natural environments are the way they are because of the ecosystems that they um, might be a, a, the environment for for example, if you if you had a nice um, valley, hills, things like that, like forests, they don't exist independent of the living organisms that are also in that area. The idea is that that environment and everything about it is connected 
to the living organisms that are there. So you wouldn't have the hills in the way that they are if it wasn't for the trees that are on the hills, okay? And, and so on. And, and we know that, you know, in order for the trees to be there, they might be dependent on the insect life um, that might allow the tree population to kind of maintain itself. So all these things are interconnected. And the idea is that if you, if you don't take care of the ecosystem of a natural landscape, for example, so you might be looking at a very beautiful landscape in front of you, but if you're not maintaining the ecosystem, that landscape might not stay the way that it is. Let's look at some examples of how. Okay, so we have, we've already talked about the idea that, you know, soil is only in e existence because of the kind of continuous supply of uh, nutrients via the decomposers and via organisms that are there dying and then, you know, allowing the nutrients from that uh, organism to be recycled into the soil. Another important uh, factor is the roots of plants, especially trees that where the roots go very deep and very wide, um, the roots are responsible for binding the soil and increasing its capacity to retain water. Okay, and when when trees have been removed and the and the roots have died, when the, it's been allowed, when those trees have been allowed to die, it has caused flooding, and there have been landslides because those roots are no longer there to bind the soil and give it the quality um, that it has. Okay, loss of ecosystems might mean that there is low water retention and could even result in droughts and dust storms and, and these things. Uh, there are examples of where, when these things have happened. Okay, so yeah, this last section is uh, two important concepts that humans get a sense of well-being and, 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 and a positive impact on their mental health, even physical health, because of the interaction with that natural environment. But that natural environment is not separate from the living organisms that are there.